Happy New Year, Nightcappers, and welcome to Gothic Nightcap, a Soul Latte Studios podcast where you listen to classic tales that can be equal parts soothing and darkness. I'm Jamie Olson, and I'll be reading The Man of Science by Jerome K. Jerome. So get comfy, light some candles, pour something to drink, or maybe even fall asleep, however you want to relax and listen. We begin. I met a man in the Strand one day that I knew very well, as I thought, though I had not seen him for years. We walked together to Charing Cross, and there we shook hands and parted. Next morning, I spoke of this meeting to a mutual friend, and then I learnt for the first time that the man had died six months before. The natural inference was that I had mistaken one man for another, an error that, not having a good memory for faces, I frequently fall into. What was remarkable about the matter, however, was that throughout our walk I had conversed with the man under the impression that he was that other dead man, and, whether by coincidence or not, his replies had never once suggested to me my mistake. As soon as I finished, Jeffson, who had been listening very thoughtfully, asked me if I believed in spiritualism to its fullest extent. That is rather a large question, I answered. What do you mean by spiritualism to its fullest extent? Well, do you believe that the spirits of the dead have not only the power of revisiting the earth at their will, but that, when here, they have the power of action, or rather, of exciting to action? Let me put a definite case. A spiritualist friend of mine, a sensible and by no means imaginative man, once told me that a table through the medium of which the spirit of a friend had been in the habit of communicating with him, came slowly across the room towards him of its own accord one night as he sat alone, and pinioned him against the wall. Now, can you believe any of that? I could, Brown took it upon himself to reply. But before doing so, I should wish for an introduction to the friend who told you the story. Speaking generally, he continued, It seems to me that the difference between what we call the natural and the supernatural is merely the difference between frequency and rarity of occurrence. Having regard to the phenomena we are compelled to admit, I think it illogical to disbelieve anything we are unable to disprove. For my part, remarked Shaughnessy, I can believe in the ability of our spirit friends to give the quaint entertainments credited to them much easier than I can in their desire to do so. You mean, added Jeffson, that you cannot understand why a spirit, not compelled as we are by the exigencies of society, should care to spend its evenings carrying on a labored and childish conversation with a room full of abnormally uninteresting people. That is precisely what I cannot understand, McShaughnessy agreed. Nor I either, said Jeffson but I was thinking of something very different altogether. Suppose a man died with the dearest wish of his heart unfulfilled. Do you believe that his spirit might have power to return to earth and complete the interrupted work? Well, answered McShaughnessy, if one admits the possibility of spirits retaining any interest in the affairs of this world at all, it is certainly more reasonable to imagine them engaged upon a task such as you suggest than to believe that they occupy themselves with the performance of mere drawing-room tricks. But what are you leading up to? Why to this, replied Jeffson, seating himself straddle-legged across a chair and leaning his arms upon the back. I was told a story this morning at the hospital by an old French doctor. The actual facts are few and simple. All that is known can be read in the Paris police records of 62 years ago. The most important part of the case, however is the part that is not known, and that never will be known. The story begins with a great wrong done by one man unto another man. What the wrong was, I do not know. I am inclined to think, however, it was connected with a woman. I think that because he who had been wronged hated him who had wronged him with a hate such as does not often burn into a man's brain, unless it be fanned by the memory of a woman's breath. 
Still, that is only conjecture, and the point is immaterial. The man who had done the wrong fled, and the other man followed him. It became a point-to-point race, the first man having the advantage of a day's start. The course was the whole world, and the stakes were the first man's life. Travelers were few and far between in those days, and this made the trail easy to follow. The first man, never knowing how far or how near the other was behind him, and hoping now and again that he might have baffled him, would rest for a while. The second man, knowing always just how far the first one was before him, never paused, and thus each day the man who was spurred by hate drew near to the man who was spurred by fear. At this town the answer to the never-varied question would be, At seven o'clock last evening, monsieur. Seven. Ah, eighteen hours. Give me something to eat, quick, while the horses are being put to. At the next, the calculation would be sixteen hours. Passing a lonely chalet, monsieur puts his head out of the window. How long since a carriage passed this way with a tall fair man inside? Such a one passed early this morning, monsieur. Thanks, drive on. A hundred francs apiece if you are through the pass before daybreak. And what for the dead horses, monsieur? Twice the value of the living. One day the man who was ridden by fear looked up and saw before him the open door of a cathedral, and, passing in, knelt down and prayed. He prayed long and fervently, for men, when they are in sore straits, clutch eagerly at the straws of faith. He prayed that he might be forgiven his sin, and, more important still, that he might be pardoned the consequences of his sin and be delivered from his adversary. And a few chairs from him, facing him, knelt his enemy, praying also. But the second man's prayer, being a thanksgiving merely, was short, so that when the first man raised his eyes, he saw the face of his enemy gazing at him across the chair tops with a mocking smile upon it. He made no attempt to rise, but remained kneeling, fascinated by the look of joy that shone out of the other man's eyes. And the other man moved the high-backed chairs, one by one, and came towards him softly. Then, just as the man who had been wronged stood beside the man who had wronged him, full of gladness that his opportunity had come, there burst from the cathedral tower a sudden clash of bells, and the man whose opportunity had come broke his heart and fell back dead with that mocking smile still playing round his mouth. And so he lay there. Then the man who had done the wrong rose up and passed out, praising God. What became of the body of the other man is not known. It was the body of a stranger who had died suddenly in the cathedral. There was none to identify it, none to claim it. Years passed away, and the Savior in the tragedy became a worthy and useful citizen and a noted man of science. In his laboratory were many objects necessary to him in his researches, and prominent among them stood in a certain corner a human skeleton. It was a very old and much-mended skeleton, and one day the long-expected end arrived, and it tumbled to pieces. Thus it became necessary to purchase another. The man of science visited a dealer he knew well, a little parchment-faced old man who kept a dingy shop where nothing was ever sold within the shadow of the towers of Notre Dame. The little parchment-faced old man had just the very thing the monsieur wanted, a singularly fine and well-proportioned study. It should be sent round and set up in monsieur's laboratory that very afternoon. The dealer was as good as his word. When monsieur entered his laboratory that evening, the thing was in its place. Monsieur seated himself in his high-backed chair and tried to collect his thoughts, but monsieur's thoughts were unruly and inclined to wander, and to wander always in one direction. Monsieur opened a large volume and commenced to read. He read of a man who had wronged another and fled from him, the other man following. Finding himself reading this, he closed the book angrily and went and stood by the window and looked out. He saw before him the sun-pierced nave of a great cathedral, and on the stones lay a dead man with a mocking smile upon his face. Cursing himself for a fool, he turned away with a laugh, but his laugh was short-lived, for it seemed to him that something else in the room was laughing also. Struck suddenly still, with his feet glued to the ground, he stood, listening for a while. 
then sought with staring eyes the corner from where the sound had seemed to come, but the white thing standing there was only grinning. Monsieur wiped the damp sweat from his head and hands and stole out. For a couple of days he did not enter the room again. On the third, telling himself that his fears were those of a hysterical girl, he opened the door and went in. To shame himself, he took his lamp in his hand and, crossing over to the far corner where the skeleton stood, examined it. A set of bones bought for three hundred francs. Was he a child to be scared by such a bogey? He held his lamp up in front of the thing's grinning head. The flame of the lamp flickered as though a faint breath had passed over it. The man explained this to himself by saying that the walls of the house were old and cracked and that the wind might creep in anywhere. He repeated this explanation to himself as he recrossed the room, walking backwards with his eyes fixed on the thing. When he reached his desk, he sat down and gripped the arms of the chair till his fingers turned white. He tried to work, but the empty sockets and that grinning head seemed to be drawing him towards them. He rose and battled with his inclination to fly screaming from the room. Glancing fearfully about him, his eye fell upon a high screen standing before the door. He dragged it forward and placed it between himself and the thing so that he could not see it, nor it see him. Then he sat down again to his work. For a while, he forced himself to look at the book in front of him, but at last, unable to control himself any longer, he suffered his eyes to follow their own bent. It may have been an hallucination. He may have accidentally placed the screen so as to favor such an illusion. But what he saw was a bony hand coming round the corner of the screen, and with a cry, he fell to the floor in a swoon. The people of the house came running in, and lifting him up, carried him out and laid him upon his bed. As soon as he recovered, his first question was, where had they found the thing? Where was it when they entered the room? And when they told him they had seen it standing where it always stood, and had gone down into the room to look again because of his frenzied entreaties, and returning trying to hide their smiles, he listened to their talk about overwork and the necessity for change and rest, and said they might do with him as they would. So, for many months the laboratory door remained locked. Then there came a chill autumn evening when the man of science opened it again and closed it behind him. He lighted his lamp and gathered his instruments and books around him and sat down before them in his high-backed chair. And the old terror returned to him. But this time he meant to conquer himself. His nerves were stronger now and his brain clearer. He would fight his unreasoning fear. He crossed to the door and locked himself in, and flung the key to the other side of the room, where it fell among jars and bottles with an echoing clatter. Later on, his old housekeeper, going her final round, tapped at his door and wished him good night, as was her custom. She received no response at first, and, growing nervous, tapped louder and called again, and at length, an answering, Good night, came back at her. She thought little about it at the time, but afterwards she remembered that the voice that had replied to her had been strangely grating and mechanical. Trying to describe it, she likened it to such a voice as she would imagine coming from a statue. Next morning, his door remained still locked. It was no unusual thing for him to work all night and far into the next day, so no one thought to be surprised. When, however, evening came, and yet he did not appear, his servants gathered outside the room and whispered, remembering what had happened once before. They listened, but could hear no sound. They shook the door and called to him, then beat with their fists upon the wooden panels. But still no sound came from the room. Becoming alarmed, they decided to burst open the door, and, after many blows, it gave way, and they crowded in. He sat bolt upright in his high-backed chair, they thought at first he had died in his sleep, but when they drew nearer and the light fell upon him, they saw the livid marks of bony fingers round his throat, and in his eyes there was a terror such as is not often seen in human eyes. Brown was the first to break the silence that followed. He asked me if I had any brandy on board. He said he felt he should like just a nip of brandy before going to bed. 
That is one of the chief charms of Jeffson's stories. They always make you feel you want a little brandy. That was The Man of Science by Jerome K. Jerome. And thank you so much for joining me. Your response and support to this podcast has been amazing, and I'm so happy to share with you some of the stories that I love to read. If you enjoy this podcast, please follow, rate, and review it to help others find us. Also, you can check out our website at soulattestudios.com for more information on upcoming story schedules. If you're listening on Spotify, I'd love to hear your ideas for stories to read in the survey on this episode's page. If you're not on Spotify, you can always send me ideas via a message on our website. The link is in the description. Also, if you've written a story you'd like me to read, that would be an honor. I'm Jamie Olson, and I recorded, edited, and produced the podcast. So, if anything was wrong, it was my fault. Our cover art is by the incredibly talented Amanda Divinity, and our music is Astaroth by Coy Discovery. Again, thank you, and pleasant dreams. <laughs>